Good afternoon, dear participants in Asia, and good morning to all of you in Europe. And welcome to the 13th Sea Change webinar, being the third one in the 2013 series, and collaboratively being developed between Sea Change Community of Practice and the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, or GIZ. This webinar is titled Climate Change Adaptation m and &E in Practice, Adaptation Made to Measure, and What is Needed Next. I see right now that we have 30 participants, and with close to 200 registrants, I'm expecting, expecting some more people to log in over the next minutes. My name is Dennis Boers, and I'm the Sea Change Team Leader. This webinar will review the development in monitoring and evaluation of adaptation and discuss knowledge needs. It will present a summary and key insights and key insights from the previous webinars by GIZ, Pioneers in Adaptation m and &E, and Getting Up to Speed, Introduction to Adaptation m and &E, which are part of a current adaptationcommunity.net discussion series, and more on adaptationcommunity.net in a moment. This webinar is part of a larger discussion series as such uh, that is implemented by GIZ. The most recent GIZ guidance documents, Adaptation Made to Measure, and the new training program on Adaptation m and &E will also be discussed shortly. The recordings of the previous GIZ webinars being discussed can be accessed through the following link. Um, it's also available on the right side of the Sea Change homepage and also on adaptationcommunity.net. The recordings of this webinar and also the documents being discussed will also be made available on this page and also on the adaptationcommunity.net. Some of you attendees this afternoon are already Sea Change members and you know about us. Uh, but for those who are new to Sea Change, I would like to explain that we are a community of practice with currently over 600 members that develops a culture of high quality and rigorous m and &E frameworks, approaches and methodologies for responses and interventions to climate change and related practices in Asia and beyond. Webinars are one way in which Sea Change is sharing knowledge, and but next to webinars we also send out a weekly newsletter, maintain a resource library and support our members in speaking engagements at conferences and we support them as well in publishing their work. If you're interested to know more, just have a look at www.seachangecop.org. Let me now introduce you to our presenters, and I will start with Ms. Vera Scholz. Ms. Vera Scholz currently heads the GIZ Competence Center for Climate Change. She is a political scientist with a focus on development policies. In addition to climate change, her expertise covers natural resource management, international trade and private sector development, the development and implementation of large-scale public and private partnership projects in the food sector, sustainable production patterns in agriculture, the implementation of voluntary certification programs, as well as corporate social responsibility. She has been advising the German government on these issues and she has also been responsible for designing several international conferences on these topics. Our second speaker for today will be Timo Leiter. Timo Leiter is a consultant on climate change adaptation with a particular focus on monitoring and evaluating adaptation at national, project and local level. He is working at GIZ's Competence Center for Climate Change in the Inventory of Methods for Adaptation to Climate Change, or IMAC, project, which connects adaptation practitioners and decision makers in seven countries. Previously, Timo was with the Institute of Environmental Studies in Sydney, researching how governments integrate adaptation into their operations. And my name is Dennis Boers. I'm the Sea Change team leader. And my job is managing the Sea Change Community of Practice and Online Knowledge Platform on the m &E of Climate Change Interventions. A little bit of logistics information for this webinar session. 
The webinar presentations will take total around 40 to 45 minutes, after which there will be time for questions and answers. Ms. Vera Scholz will start in a moment with an introduction of GIZ's work in the climate change arena, with a focus on GIZ's competence center for climate change and related global climate change projects. She will also touch upon the importance of online exchange and M&E in adaptation. After that, Mr. Timo Leiter will zoom in and focus specifically on the monitoring and evaluation of climate change adaptation interventions. He will present insights from the previous webinars, Pioneers in Adaptation M&E, and the other one called Getting Up to Speed, Introduction to Adaptation M&E. And he will also touch upon the most recent GIZ guidance document called Adaptation Made to Measure. And he'll discuss shortly a new training program on adaptation M&E. After that, I will take over for the last 10 to 15 minutes. And with Ms. Scholz and Mr. Leiter's presentations in mind, we know where we are right now, but what might be needed ne next? What are the specific needs of climate change adaptation M&E professionals? And after that, there is 20 to 30 minutes time for a Q&A session. Any questions that have not been answered during these 20 to 30 minutes will be answered offline and published on our website, together with a recording of the webinar. And you will find that through the link that is shown right here. And it will also be on adaptationcommunity.net. How does the Q&A session work? During the session, you can type your questions or comments in the question field in the software, after which we will present the questions to our presenters. And as I said, any question that has not been answered during the 20 to 30 minute Q&A session will later on be answered offline and published on our website. The questions will be answered by uh, myself and by Mr. Timo Leiter. Uh, Ms. Vera Scholz, unfortunately, um, has other things. Uh, to attend to, uh, but we are happy to hear from her um, a little bit about GIZ's work in the climate change arena. And having said that, I will hand over the microphone to Ms. Scholz and uh, we'll hear from her about GIZ and climate change. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dennis, so far. And good afternoon and good morning to all participants in Asia and Europe. Um, on behalf of the Competence Center for Climate Change of the GIZ, I would like to welcome you to this webinar, which is jointly organized by the project Inventory of Methods for Adaptation to Climate Change, IMAC, and the Sea Change Community of Practice. Before turning to the particular topic of monitoring and evaluation, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly introduce you to the work GIZ is undertaking in climate change adaptation. GIZ is an implementing agency active in development cooperation operating on behalf of the German government. With 17,000 employees and offices in more than 130 countries, GIZ is a leading global service provider for sustainable development. GIZ is currently undertaking several hundred climate change projects worldwide the majority with a focus on adaptation. For example, the project Climate Change Adaptation in Rural Areas of India is supporting the development of state action plans on climate change and piloting adaptation measures as well as climate proofing public investments. In South Africa, the Climate Protection Program is supporting the implementation of the National Climate Change Response Strategy, including strengthening national greenhouse gas inventories, mainstreaming adaptation into local development planning, and developing a national climate change response M&E system. GIZ's Competence Center for Climate Change in Germany is providing state-of-the-art knowledge to the organization as well as managing a number of global projects, for example, the International Partnership on Mitigation MOV, which provides a platform for exchange good practice.
www.mitigationpartnership.net. This project is funded by the German Ministry for Environment. Another project is the Climate Finance Readiness Program, which supports countries in ac accessing financial means from international climate funds like the Adaptation Fund or the Green Climate Fund, which is now being built. This project is funded by our ministry, our German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. There's a third project we are running here at the Competence Center for Climate Change. That is the Inventory of Methods for Adaptation to Climate Change. The abbreviation is IMAC, um, which is funded by the International Climate Initiative of our Ministry of Environment here in Germany. It connects policymakers and adaptation practitioners through an international community of practice and supports practical applications of methods and tools for adaptation. I'm inviting you to explore IMAX platform, which is www.adaptationcommunity.net and benefit from its knowledge, products and opportunities for exchange. Dennis, now you can come to the second slide, please. The IMAC project is uh, co-hosting today's webinar on monitoring and evaluation. M&E of adaptation is important to asset, um, assess whether adaptation interventions bring about their desired effects and to analyze what has worked well and what, ha what has not. Lessons learned through M&E thus can inform policy and improve future adaptation actions. Yet monitoring and measuring adaptation and practice is very challenging due to uncertainties in climate projections at local levels, long time scales, the close interaction of climate and non-climate uh, climatic drivers of change, as well as the lack of universal metric for adaptation. GIZ has developed an approach to adaptation M&E at project level, which will be presented to you shortly. GIZ is also supporting number, numerous countries in the, developing, in the development of national level M&E systems for adaptation, including in the Philippines, Mexico, Mongolia, South Africa, and India. I welcome the partnership with CX, C Exchange Community of Practice on M&E and encourage members of C Exchange and Adaptation Community Net to interact with each other. Um, to advance the practice of monitoring and evaluation and the adaptation process more generally. On this occasion, I thank the speakers and participants for joining us today, and I wish you a very exciting webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vera, for this, uh, for this introduction and uh, for the kind words about our collaboration uh, with uh, adaptationcommunity.net, uh, which is something we, uh, we are looking forward to as well. Uh, it's a good start through this webinar. And with your introduction, I want to give uh, the screen to Timo Leiter, who will do the main part of this, uh, of this presentation. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, Vera. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, welcome to all participants uh, from my side as well. Um, I hope you can see my slides now. Yes. Yep. Uh, yes. Great. Okay. So uh, taking um, taking on from what Vera just presented to you, a uh, very brief uh, context. Um, so this webinar is the fourth uh, IMAC webinar on monitoring and evaluation. Uh, IMAC, as Vera presented, is a project that um, builds an inventory of existing adaptation methods uh, focusing on seven emerging uh, uh, countries for example India, the Philippines, Indonesia, Mexico and South Africa uh, and Tunisia as well and um, so what we are doing in this project at the moment is we hold a so-called discussion series uh, where we focus for a period of four months on these three topics which you see on the screen now the first one is adaptation, monitoring, and evaluation. And next week we are starting with uh, climate information and services for another series of four weeks of webinars. And followed by that will be mainstreaming. And uh, all webinar recordings are available at adaptationcommunity.net under the exchange uh, section. Uh, 
Um, yeah. So today, um, this is, as I said, the fourth webinar of IMEC on monitoring and evaluation. And so the purpose of my talk right now is to uh, distill the key lessons we have learned uh, in the previous three webinars um, and to look at uh, what is needed next. And this will uh, fit to what Dennis is presenting to you in his presentation. So um, the three uh, webinars we had so far, the first one focused on the national level uh, adaptation, monitoring and evaluation. The second one introduced a new training program specifically on adaptation M&E, the GIZ is developing at the moment. And the third one focused on our publication Adaptation Made to Measure, which I'll also give you an overview on in a few minutes. So focusing with, uh, starting with the first uh, webinar on national level adaptation M&E. So the, the key question on the national level is how to assess progress in adaptation in a certain country. So how do you know whether a certain country is preparing for the likely effects of climate change? And there is an increased international interest in this topic uh, at the moment. Uh, many countries are starting to, to look at this issue and see how they can develop such an M&T system, but there's very limited experience so far. In fact, there are only three countries that have uh, an up and running uh, M&T system uh, focusing on climate change adaptation at the moment, and these are the UK with its, uh, with its subcommittee on adaptation. Germany which it's, uh, with its indicator uh, monitoring framework and Finland. Um, and in the webinar three weeks ago we had the um, two of the emerging countries which are currently starting to develop such a system. The Philippines may be uh, most, the most advanced one and also South Africa. And we in that webinar listened to presentations from speakers from both countries and in the discussion uh, also compared these two experiences. Um, I invite you to, to listen to that recording uh, on our website to get all the details, uh, but briefly showing you um, in both countries the starting point is the national adaptation strategy and in the Philippines the climate change adaptation action plan is outlining uh, seven strategic priorities including for example food security or water security and it already includes results chains and uh, so the M&T is focusing on these results chains. In South Africa in contrast, um, the, it hasn't been decided yet what this M&T system will focus on on the national level. So South Africa has started a stakeholder process um, with, uh, to first of all identify what should be the focus of such an climate change response m and &E system, this is how they call it, and um, what sh exactly should be measured. Um, in both countries it's also interesting just to look at the role um, of the respective departments or commissions that are in charge of developing that system. There's a difference because in the Philippines the Climate Change Commission on the national level does have the uh, necessary um, or has the, the statutory obligation to guide the patient policy, uh, policy across all departments, whereas in uh, South Africa the Department of Environmental Affairs does officially have the coordination power but still has to coordinate with the other ministries. So uh, once again for more details please um, check the webinar recording. Um, to distill the lessons uh, from the discussion, so on national level we see the areas where further development is needed. Um, one of the key things that always comes up is possibility and limitations of linking local level adaptation uh, lessons or M&E with the national level M&E system. So the question um, whether the national level system is able to capture um, what is going on on the ground or whether it is more a high level indicator system. The second question is um, of course the question that always comes up how to differentiate adaptation and development. For example, uh, in the Q&A session during this webinar, one of the questions was how the Philippines um, adaptation M&E system is differentiating uh, indicators for food security, uh, security uh, the adaptation part of it from the regular development part. And the Philippines are just in the process of 
identifying their indicators at the moment, so they and these indicators are not available yet. Um, but this is a very important uh, point. Uh, key question also is what exactly is being measured? Um, so do you look at high-level indicators, headline indicators for particular sectors, as is the case in the German M&D system? Or are you looking more in depth at particular issues, as the UK is doing, which is focusing every year on a different topic? For example, last year it was flooding and water scarcity, and then they analyze uh, with all available data um, using a particular uh, framework. They look at what the barriers to adaptation are, how policies can incentivize uh, wise adaptation, and they've got three categories of indicators, climate change impacts, um, climate change actions, focusing on whether uh, low-hanging fruits are um, um, built upon and whether long-term decisions take climate change into account. And they also look at drivers of vulnerability. And they uh, uh, publish an annual report called uh, Progress on Ad Adaptation to Climate Change. Um, so yeah, these are, the, so these are the key issues where we think further development is needed. And the key takeaways uh, so far, as I said, there are limited experiences internationally. But what is becoming clear is that national level adaptation M&E is far more diverse than, for example, project level adaptation M&D, where you can just use your results chain. On the national level, it can be very different due to national context and also due to um, what is supposed to be measured and how this is integrated into existing institutions and government um, uh, government relations. And the second point is that these political and administrative settings really need to be taken into account. So the question is what department is running the process, what role does that department have, um, so these aspects as well. It was also described to us in the South African case that the Department of Environmental Affairs has to convince other departments that this is not just a burden but that there is a benefit uh, to adaptation and that brings us to the final key takeaway which is um, not it's advised not to start with indicators but first of all to ask what is the system supposed to achieve is the system about informing policy or is it about high-level adaptation information? Uh, and these questions would need to uh, be at the start. So much to the national level. Once again, I invite you to uh, listen to the particular webinar. Coming to the second webinar, um, uh, uh, Germany, um, GSZ is currently developing uh, new training modules. Um, that will build on an existing training by GIZ and OECD called Integrating Adaptation into Development Planning. This training program provides a systematic introduction to adaptation to climate change um, and it's based on a, on the Harvard case method, so it's very interactive. It is not an online training, but an on-site training, usually running through two or three days, depending on, you can choose, it's a modular uh, structure. Um, so there's always a short presentation, and then there are um, interactive sessions and exercises. All the materials are freely available online. You can find the it's a little hidden on the OECD website, um, but you can find the link on our website adaptationcommunity.net. Uh, and now we are developing new modules on adaptation M&E because um, so far, to our knowledge, no general training program specifically on monitoring and evaluation of climate change adaptation exists. So we are developing uh, four new model modules. One is Introduction to Adaptation M&E, and this is the module that has been presented in the second webinar. And then there's also a module on national level M&E and one on project level M&E. Uh, these modules are, um, a first test run with them is done uh, at the beginning of May at a workshop in Mexico. And we expect the full materials to be available by mid this year. And they will also be put online to the OECD homepage where they can be freely, uh, freely downloaded. And um, to check out the slides of the introduction module and to get the link to the training materials, I invite you to go to adaptationcommunity.net under the exchange session. Um, so much to the training in Brazil.
brief. Um, now I would like to introduce you um, in a little more detail to GIZ's publication Adaptation Made to Measure, which was the subject of the third webinar. Um, this publication is focusing on the project level uh, in a development cooperation uh, context, so it does not provide guidance on national level M&D. Um, and this publication has been written um, uh, because many uh, employees, even within our organization, um, approached the Competence Center for Climate Change uh, on this crucial question, what is an adaptation project? So in this guidebook, uh, the full title of which is um, a guidebook to the uh, development of climate change adaptation projects and its results-based monitoring systems, we look at how adaptation projects can be designed and how M&E can be part of that project planning. So the guidebook looks at the um, specific climate change adaptation aspects. It is based on a uh, previously uh, published study together with the World Resources Institute called Making Adaptation Count and which presents a six-step framework and we have uh, further developed that into two st uh, five steps which I will show you in a second and um, so it presents you five general steps if you want to download the publication uh, you can just google adaptation made to measure and the, the second hit should be the download so the five steps uh, first of all, look at the specific adaptation situation of your uh, project or program. The second one is to look at the adaptation process and how your project can contribute to adaptation. The third one is to build a results chain or a theory of change. And the fourth one is building on that theory of change to identify a baseline and choose indicators. And the fifth one is to operationalize the system and we will now look at each of these five steps in more detail. For the first one, describing the adaptation context, the question here really is what is the adaptation situation? So the question is um, what are the drivers of vulnerability for example? Um, what is at risk? Um, um, what um, is the rationale basically for your adaptation project and um, there are climatic factors that are of course uh, important for that to look at um, like temperature uh, and so on and to look at um, predictions or projections if they are available on climatic change in the particular uh, area you're focusing on and also if available vulnerability assessments or climate impact uh, or risk analysis um, and one way to get um, the uh, global climate in information um, would be, for example, to use the homepage uh, CI Grasp, um, the full name of which is Climate Impacts Global and Regional Adaptation Support Platform, where you can find an interactive um, climate diagram generator that shows you for each parcel of, I think, 10 to 10 kilometers. Uh, the expected um, temperature and precipitation based on uh, various climate, uh, global climate circulation models. And then secondly, of course, non-climatic factors are also very important. So what are the social and economic um, developments and key drivers uh, in the particular area or the particular target group you're focusing on? Uh, how does this affect vulnerability? So, and the purpose of the first step really is to get a picture of what is going on and um, how climate change affects your target group and uh, so this is the base, basic analysis for your project. Uh, the second step is to look at the adaptation uh, process and how you can address this, the, the process. Um, the World Resources Institute um, has developed these uh, three dimensions, they call it, of the adaptation process. The first one is uh, building adaptive capacity. Um, so building the potential uh, to adapt, this can be for example that the necessary resources are in place, that um, there's uh, awareness, that uh, data is available, that plans are being made. So all these activities are enabling 
but not necessarily mean that adaptation uh, will take place. The second step is uh, actual adaptation actions that are reducing vulnerability, for example, introducing new crop varieties, um, uh, building uh, water um, proof infrastructure, or if you face water scarcity, um, build water reservoirs, for example. And the third one, the top of this pyramid, is to what they call sustained development. So how to safeguard uh, development objectives despite climate change. And this, to many, is seen as the overall goal of adaptation. So how does this help you in, in designing your project? Um, this three-dimensional uh, pyramid um, has the idea to focus you on how your project can contribute to the holistic uh, adaptation process and you can also use this in monitoring and evaluation uh, because most likely the indicators that, it, that you would use for each of these dimensions would differ. So for example for adaptive capacity an indicator could be whether adaptation uh, plans are in place and uh, the extent to which they are acted upon. And for the second dimension, uh, an indicator could be uh, the proportion of yields um, or the, for example, diversity uh, of income of the target group. Um, so the proportion of, of income that is um, due to climate sensitive um, economic sectors and the proportion that is not due to climate sensitive sectors. For further details, uh, please also have a look at the um, guidebook. You can just uh, Google uh, adaptation, uh, making adaptation count, and you will find the publication on the World Resources homepage. Um, coming to the third uh, and very important step, so once you have analyzed the situation and looked at the adaptation process, the question is how you how you intend your project to deliver adaptation, so to say. And a first question is um, your strategic direction. So what uh, strengths uh, does your organization have? What resources do you have available? What partners, uh, partners are you collaborating with? And then you're creating uh, a results chain or theory of change, uh, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. There is the traditional linear results chain that distinguishes between inputs, which is left of activities, so what you uh, or inputs you're providing, then the activities you intend to undertake, what outputs will be resulting from that, um, what outcomes, intermediate short term and medium term effects will result from these outputs, and what impacts uh, you may achieve. And these black arrows in between of these categories symbolize assumptions that are being made on how the project um, is supposed to achieve its outcomes. And uh, whilst I'm sure you're familiar with this, um, uh, there's a new uh, way that um, we are uh, starting to look at the GZ at the moment. Um, it is more, very much more complex. So it is not the linear results chain which you have just seen, but it is an, an attempt to um, to account for the complexity that we are facing uh, in development projects and in adaptation projects in particular, where climatic and non-climatic factors interact. So what you see here in all these, um, first of all, you see the, the big orange objective box. And all other boxes are just termed results. So there's no longer the distinction between outputs, outcomes, uh, and so on. But you just um, everything is just um, treated as a result. The colors of the boxes um, reflect whether they uh, are um, presenting adaptation actions, adaptive capacity, or sustained development. So the color of the boxes uh, refer back to the dimensions of step one, uh, sorry, of step two. And for example, uh, the green boxes reflect um, capacity, uh, adaptation, uh, adaptive capacity. For example, the box in the lower right corner is development uh, uh, developing programs um, 
and yeah, VWISE, so basically adaptation plans, uh, which is adapt building adaptive capacity. And the, uh, for example, the left uh, yellow-ish box uh, vulnerability of individual communities reduced, that would be an adaptation action. Um, and this way of mapping results um, also uh, enables you, what you see here is these red arrows and the black and gray bars. Um, this is mentioning the key instruments that are used to achieve these results. So LTE stands for long-term um, expert and SCE for short-term experts. Um, so I, once again, I also invite you to look at the details which are described in the publication in the chapter on step three. Um, but uh, once again, to summarize in step three, it's about mapping out how your project is supposed to work. And quickly coming to the fourth step, uh, that is then uh, looking at what is your baseline and most importantly, what indicators you can use. And here, jumping back to the previous slide, for each of these results, you can look what indicators best describe these results. So this is how this third step helps you identify uh, appropriate indicators. And there are these general criteria for indicators, uh, of course. And uh, together, the intention is that your indicators capture the adaptation-specific uh, aspects of the project. I'm speeding up a little little bit, so coming to the final step, which is operationalizing uh, the MNG system. So here looking, you're looking at where does the data uh, come from? Is the data available through primary information or do you need to um, f possibly uh, do your own studies or is the data available through secondary uh, sources like statistical uh, authorities? And then a key point of the fifth step really is to look at knowledge management. So how do you make use uh, of the results coming out of your m and &E process? And how are these lessons learned disseminated beyond your project and how do they inform adaptation uh, decisions? So uh, quickly wrapping up, um, the analysis of the adaptation context is the first one. Then looking at the adaptation process, the third step is key, looking at how your project is intended to work. Then looking at indicators and baselines and how to operationalize the system. And to this is my final slide. Um, key lessons from this third webinar. Areas for further development on project level adaptation m and &E, and the adaptation made to measure guidebook. So um, we are interested to learn more um, experiences with these more complex results framework, which I just presented. Um, so how does this uh, how is this useful in practice? Uh, also, where are the greatest difficulties in operationalizing uh, these five steps? And also the guidebook is discussing about how to evaluate adaptation interventions. I didn't present this because there isn't much, uh, isn't sufficient time right now. But there's also under step four uh, a paragraph, uh, a few paragraphs on how to evaluate adaptation. Uh, for example, using uh, higher level indicators such as safe health or safe wells. Um, so areas of further development are also how these indicators may be useful and also, for example, how vulnerability assessments can be used to evaluate your adaptation project. Um, so key takeaways uh, from that webinar have been that adaptation made to measure is, provides a useful way to structure the process, but obviously, as any guidebook, it cannot provide you a cookbook um, stepwise procedure on, on any specific uh, or on, on any um, challenge that may uh, arise. And um, the webinar also presents a very nice example from India. So I once again invite you to look at that, uh, to listen to the webinar recording. And um, so to, to the final point is there are many key challenges on project level M&E um, that I'm sure Dennis will also touch upon. And the question is how these can be addressed um, by our communities of practice. So thank you very much. And with that, I would like to hand back to Dennis. 
thank you very much, uh, Timo, for this uh, for this introduction to the uh, to the work that uh, GIZ is doing, um, to the uh, webinar series that you uh, that you just had, and uh, and also to the uh, uh, to the document that has been developed um, on measuring. Uh, in adaptation settings, adaptation made to measure. Um, and that document is based on a previous uh, document that was developed by GIZ together with the World Resource Institute, as, as uh, Timo mentioned. And I would say that both are really worth a good read. Uh, they are very interesting, uh, interesting documents, and I do appreciate the five steps that are uh, being laid out in uh, in this in this latest documents, uh, both of the two documents and the presentation slides uh, are available on the link that I that I showed you before. Uh, they will also be uh, sent around to all attendees uh, the link so that you know where to where to find it. And it's also available on adaptationcommunity.net. And uh, I was asked um, to talk about what is needed next. Um, because Sea Change is a community of practice, and we hear quite a bit from our members what what they need. Um, and a first point I wanted to wanted to start with is um, something that is also being uh, touched upon in the uh, in the uh, um, document by GIZ, that is climate adaptation in the context of development cooperation, where perhaps. Uh, seven years ago, everything was really focusing purely on climate change, climate change adaptation, the m and &E of adaptation settings. More and more now we're looking at how does this then fit in the bigger development picture. And I, I, I think that is a, is a very good development. And uh, OECD DAC uh, came to the um, adaptation definition as an activity should be classified as adaptation related if it intends to reduce the vulnerability of human or natural systems to the impact of climate change and climate related risks by maintaining or increasing adaptive capacity and resilience. Um, looking at the development cooperation context, I have to say that um, climate var variability has always been taken into account. For example, in the seasonality of disease outbreaks and related responses or responses to floods or droughts. And the definition of the uh, OECD DAC on adaptation to climate change and reducing vulnerability uh, is correct in the sense from a climate change adaptation perspective, but it is also very relevant from a development cooperation perspective without taking an adaptation focus. Adaptation to climate change is not, therefore, perhaps a completely new area for development support. It overlaps with disaster risk reduction, natural resource management, ecosystem management, livelihoods development, agricultural improvements, and related vulnerability reduction um, interventions. And that is something that also comes forward out of the uh, document uh, on, uh, by GIZ. And I think that's good to take into account that adaptation is not something new, something that, that is a, 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 a something of the last years. No, it's something that we, that we have been looking at already for a little while. A difference perhaps is that climate change adaptation should be taking into account both current and expected climate conditions and their consequences for human beings and ecosystems, whereas development cooperation mainly takes into account current climate conditions. Then again, how many climate change adaptation programs are actually taking into account expected climate conditions? I'm then talking about climate conditions 40 years from now. How many programs on climate change adaptation currently are looking at the uh, climate conditions in 40 years from now? And when looking at business as usual, shouldn't that is already taking into account current and seasonal climate vari uh, variability. But are we at the moment not already at a point where climate change should perhaps be considered as business as usual in the sense that there is no need to differentiate between a 
climate uh, focus development cooperation project and a climate adaptation project. I'm in no way saying here um, that that, in, uh, that that then takes away the need for uh, publications like Adaptation Made to Measure. I think actually that these publications become more relevant because they should not only be applied in pure climate adaptation contexts, they should actually be taken into account in any type of development cooperation context. And, and one thought I had, there is a Millennium Development Goal uh, that looks at, uh, at goal number seven, that looks at ensuring environmental sustainability, but it mostly looks at uh, access to, s to sanitation and it looks at uh, ecosystems and it looks at um, uh, the decline of the number of animals, uh, but it, shouldn't there be a Millennium Development Goal number nine, ensuring climate change appropriate development? And with that, move away from differentiating between explicit adaptation projects, climate smart development projects, and standard development projects. Just use it as a new millennium development goal and incorporate it as such in any type of development cooperation, which then increases the relevance for publications like Adaptation Made to Measure. And Another point that also Timo uh, touched upon was the linking between the various levels, global, national, subnational, local levels. And one of the uh, publications that worked on that is uh, one from IIED, uh, Working Papers number one and number five, and the latest one is from 2030, and it's called Tracking Adaptation and uh, Measuring Development. And it is intended to be a flexible framework for evaluating adaptation and adaptation relevant development. Uh, and it has a twin track framework, which means that it evaluates the extent and quality of climate risk management from top uh, down. That's track one. And it also look at the, looks at the associated development and adaptation outcomes and the long, longer term impacts on the ground and then upwards. And that is track two. And I think when you're looking over various levels, it is important to link track one and track two developments, where you right now see that you have two triangles, one pointing down and the other pointing up, and then you have a frame of influence in between those two. Uh, the question is how you link these two, um, th these two triangles, and that is uh, where we currently need to have some more knowledge, I'm, I'm thinking. We also need to be realistic about the capacity of countries to implement such a twin track, twin track approach and really reach um, and really reaching the local level through track one is is that really happening or really reaching the global level to through track two is that really happening it's not just about the wide variety of stakeholders and the sectors involved and the financial impacts involved for some of these stakeholders and some sectors it's also about national m and &E systems being able to implement such a twin track system. And I, I do feel that a number of countries would not have uh, the capacity uh, to um, implement such a system based on their current uh, national level m and &E practices. And having said that, linking the, these various levels, there might be an important role for the inventory of methods for adaptation to climate change, IMAC. Given this inventory, might possibly present methods over various levels and be able to indicate linkages between these levels because, because it brings together practitioners with policy makers. And I think that might be uh, an area where IMAC can support uh, the work of GIZ and answer the question on what about linking these levels. Then the key challenges of project level M&E. They are not really any different in climate change adaptation. To me, these key challenges are true hold value for any type of complex intervention with a range of stakeholders over a range of sectors. Um, availability of data is a problem for many programs operating in developing economies. Uh, defining indicators, yes, there is not a rich history of climate change relevant programs and thus also not a rich history on indicators, but there is a lot to learn from existing approaches towards vulnerability reduction in, for example, livelihood settings. 
qualitative quantitative discussion mixed method approaches and developmental evaluation already exists since the early and mid 90s so it, it is not a new discussion uh, unexpected events are nothing new either to programs operating in developing economies the central african republic just had an unexpected event it had a coup d'etat uh, a change of power by military rule so that is quite an unexpected event and it's not just something for developing economies developed economies also have their um, unexpected events like the internet bubble, like the housing crisis, like the euro crisis, the US automobile industry and I can make that a very long list I think. So in that sense it's not a new challenge to climate change adaptation interventions. Uh, last point would be the attribution versus contribution discussion and also this one is not a new one. This one is not limited to the adaptation field but uh, is a discussion that uh, m and &E people on, on quite high levels uh, talk about. Assessing attribution, you do that to determine if the program caused the observed outcomes and in that sense when you look at contribution, you want to determine if the program contributed to or helped to cause the, uh, the observed outcomes. And when you're looking at climate change or when you're looking at any type of uh, complex intervention, um, uh, climate change adaptation intervention or any type of, of complex um, program intervention or policy intervention, then you will have so many stakeholders implementing and you will have so many various sectors and you will have so many different uh, variables that influence the outcome, especially because you're also measuring over a very long term that the question is, is, is it really worth looking at attribution and shouldn't we just be talking about contribution uh, that's a discussion that I think donors should be starting to feel comfortable with as well because the question of attribution versus contribution is not just one for um, academics on M&E it's also a discussion about donors and proving uh, that you um, actually reach the results that you uh, said you would be reaching maybe causal explanation is too optimistic due to too many influencing variables. Claiming to make contribution uh, to results is perhaps uh, more likely. So that is, uh, these are some ideas that I have personally. And if I then look at what is needed next, what do the sea change members say? Because we rec uh, recently had the um, evaluation conclave in Kathmandu and we had 25 sea change members together. What do they see as what is needed for them? The first point was uh, resource sharing, information sharing through online platforms is seen as very important and uh, that makes a good case for communities like uh, Adaptation, um, Community.net and Sea Change. Uh, webinars are very much appreciated and it's a, it's a very good tool to um, ch exchange information on uh, approaches that are out there like this uh, new approach, well not a new approach but this uh, new steps uh, that, are being that have been developed by GIZ. Um, people also like a critical analysis of resources available. There's a lot being developed but the question is what is actually applicable to the specific situation of, of people. And people would like to see more reviews of evaluation findings, especially on process evaluation. How did you get to a certain outcome? It's not just about the outcome, it's also how you got there. Um, people indicate that they would like to work in working groups to share experiences in a limited group of people on very specific topics. So that could be a role as well that communities of practice can play to, to develop that environment for their practitioners to discuss very specific uh, topics within the climate change adaptation m and &E field. And e-learning, and it's not just about e-learning, it's also about workshops on locations. I'm very happy to hear about uh, the GIZ OECD training material uh, that's available online and that can be uh, adopted to your uh, personal preferences. Um, and I'm also very happy to hear that uh, the m and &E part to this uh, training material is currently being further developed and being tested in, uh, in Mexico if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, and I'm looking forward to see those coming online uh, mid-2013. So that's a very good development and, and Sea change would, uh, would want to uh, help on getting more materials out there as well. Um, so these are some of the points that have been indicated by Sea change members. 
Another point, maybe a bit further away, is to have a help desk function on climate change M&E, a kind of a peer assist function, uh, where you can go with your specific climate change M&E problems and then be linked to s certain um, uh, professionals in the field who then answer your questions. And another point that uh, comes uh, is, is being brought forward quite a bit is the development of an indicator database. Um, having discussed that just recently with a few Sea Change members, um, a, a point with an indicator database is that indicators should be interpreted within their uh, in the within the framework in which they are chosen, in which they are developed. An indicator in itself might not perhaps say so much in, in an indicator database, so you will need to have a framework uh, around it that explains why that indicator was chosen in a certain setting and how it was used. Uh, then it might say something. But having me talking is one thing. I, we want to hear from you as well uh, what you take away from the information that, uh, that Timo presented. Uh, if you have any questions for Timo, if you have any specific uh, needs yourself with respect to your M&E work and adaptation settings, and I put uh, Timo back online with his microphone so that he can answer questions as well. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask people to, uh, to type their questions in the question field and um, just ask us. Thank and you, Dennis. Yes. Timo, um, t take the microphone a little bit further away from your, from your mouth. You're very loud at the moment. Better this way? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, I get another, uh, I get a first question here, and that is, what is the value of explicit adaptation projects as opposed to development that integrates adaptation? Question for me, or? Um, I don't know, feel free to answer it. Or, or <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a very good question. So, uh, yeah, as Dennis also uh, explained, I mean, ideally, um, all projects would just uh, take climate change into account, so all projects would be climate proofed. However, um, in reality, there is a process of getting, like if you talk about development cooperation, getting climate change uh, integrated into existing projects. Um, at GRZ, uh, for this purpose, we have had a climate change uh, strategy um, by which we have uh, significantly, uh, significantly increased the share of GRZ projects that now take climate change into account or that explicitly focus on climate change. But this has taken uh, four or five years, so um, yes, I would agree. Ideally, we wouldn't need separate climate change projects, but in reality, um, getting there re uh, requires having these projects um, to then more and more mainstream it into all projects. Mm -hmm. um, one, one point, uh, one question as well linking to this one is how can we better harness lessons from explicit adaptation projects to better inform development practice? Um, yeah, that is a very good question and uh, in fact there are quite some um, websites out there including uh, the sea change one and the adaptation community one that attempt to um, disseminate and spread these lessons learned but there's still uh, much more work needed um, to disseminate these lessons um, beyond just a few uh, statements that you can f or pre a few project descriptions that you can find on, on some home pages um, so this is definitely an area to, to continue working on um, because uh, it's always said that m and e should you know inform policy and and um, that uh, what works well should be upscaled but I, I still see a deficit there on, on how this uh, happens um, within GIZ we are now trying to do this more uh, systematically, um, but yeah, that's, I, I totally agree. This is an area which needs further attention. Um, I, I see a question from Tahir who asks, is there any m and &E evaluation analysis available regarding early warning systems being implemented in creek villages in coastal areas in South Asia? Um, that is a very specific question. And I, I am aware of um, 
guidance on adaptation programming in coastal areas, but I do not have the information at the moment on whether there is a specific m and &E evaluation focus on um, coastal areas, and I would actually think there isn't. Do you know, Timo, if there is a specific focus on m and &E evaluation analysis on, on uh, coastal areas or on creek villages? Uh, no, unfortunately not. No, I think I, I think it's it's a, it's very specific as well, and you have to wonder if if my questioning on whether or not climate change adaptation M and E is something new, um, if if I'm questioning that already towards normal development projects, then you have to wonder whether or not you need to have. Uh, such a very narrow focus. If you if you would say that there is a specific M and E evaluation analysis available on only creek villages or on, on on coastal areas, that would mean that it would perhaps be quite hard to move the analysis, move the data up one level as well. It would then only be applicable to that very narrow definition it is looking at. And yeah, I, I don't think that is the way that we would want to move forward with, with m and &E in, in climate change adaptation. It, it's good if we can learn lessons from it that, that are wider applicable uh, with taking into account the specific uh, situation of, um, of, of the program on the ground, taking into account that we're here in a coastal area in a creek village and all the climatic and non-climatic conditions that come with that setting. And other um, point here is from Deep Ayadi who says Himalayan climate initiative is developing frameworks on climate smart living in the Himalayas incorporating the different areas of development um, and he would like to share that with, with all of you that that is good and that is quite a specific focus uh, and I know that the uh, Himalayan uh, climate initiative um, and, and the mountain initiatives are specifically focusing on, on mountain environments. Um, let me see. Are there any lessons to be learned from m and &E related to DRR projects? Surely there must be longer experience in the DRR area. And that is Marita Manley who asks that question. question. Uh, Timo, would you have any feedback on that one? Um, yes, uh, in on DRR there's this global, I think it's called Hyogo Framework mm -hmm. um, on disaster risk reduction uh, by the United Nations and it does include uh, a set of indicators um, and certainly DRR is a field uh, which is far more longer running than, than adaptation itself and there's definitely, there are definitely things to learn. Um, however, adaptation is, is broader than than that, so um, yes, it's good to look at, at indicators, and GIZ is also having, for example, projects in Mozambique looking at um, where they uh, installed community committees, uh, community uh, disaster committees um, that increase the awareness, and so in in such cases, there are definitely, for example, indicators and things that. Uh, from the DRR community and longer running experience that uh, we should look at an adaptation. Um, however, there are other cases where adaptation is not focusing on DRR, where we need other uh, sources of uh, inspiration. Um, and another question that is from uh, Kong Chuan. Um, does GIZ have any climate change related projects in Cambodia? Um, I would need to look at the uh, database. I think currently GIZ has more than 400 climate change uh, projects, so those that explicitly focus on adaptation. Um, I, would, I don't know by heart right now, I, but I could find out. Okay, okay. Um, a question... So if that yeah. person wanted to send me an email to timo.leiter at gizde, I could find out. Okay, that is timo.leiter at giz.de to email Timo and ask him for the specific programs in specific countries. Um, climate change adaptation m and &E can be extremely valuable to inform policy decisions. Are policy mainstreaming issues part of your plans with GIZ? And what tools do you use to share with governmental bodies uh, with respect to the data and the uh, evidence, evaluation evidence? And that's Daniela Tarizo asking that one. 
Um, yes, that is a very important question. Uh, in fact, a key focus of our climate change work is to try to mainstream climate change uh, adaptation. And we do this on various levels. For example, in South Africa, we have commissioned a study uh, for a response, uh, a so-called response toolkit that helps local governments integrating a climatic risk into their um, integrated development plans and we are running workshops in South Africa to uh, introduce uh, local government officials to that. In other countries, for example in Peru, we are currently involved in um, mainstreaming adaptation considerations into uh, public investment decision-making frameworks, which is also a very interesting area. So we've got many uh, projects of this kind uh, running in different countries. We have got a, a general four-step framework, which is called uh, Climate Proofing for Development, mm -hmm. which is similar to, uh, it's a similarly uh, stepwise framework as the adaptation made to measure. And um, to the second part of the question, the spe what specific data I think we were using, that mm -hmm. really depends on the project, on the scale, whether it is working with national governments or with uh, local governments. Um, but uh, yeah, for if the person's interested in this general document, I think if if you Google climate proofing for development uh, GIZ, then this publication uh, should come up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a question from Wahidullah Pades: Is there any comprehensive indicator list available? And I can already answer that question. Uh, that is, uh, no, there is not a all-encompassing all indicator list available. Um, uh, I'm. In the, in the beginning, I was always thinking that that would be really the holy grail, having an indicator database that is showing all indicators. But more and more, I start to wonder whether the specific contexts of uh, adaptation programs or any type of climate-focused uh, programming, also from a development perspective, if it would really help to have such a comprehensive indicator list. I, I think it would be good to have uh, some indicators available to you as, as an example, uh, but there, there is a risk that you would otherwise too easily um, go to the list, type in your type of program, and then just assume that that type of, um, of indicator that is shown there, that that type of indicator will completely uh, be a applicable to your setting. Having said that, there, there are indicators out there. I know that the Care, Poverty, Environment and Climate Change Network has, has some indicators uh, on their side. I know that um, there are some being mentioned in Adaptation Made to Measure. Uh, there are some being mentioned in uh, previous uh, frameworks that have been developed by UNDP. Uh, by uh, organizations like Tango, by um, uh, the GEF, by World Resource Institute, by UK CIP. So there are indicators out there. And I also know that USAID is coming with their global climate change M&E framework uh, somewhere mid-summer. And that would come as well with a full list of, uh, of indicators. Um, so, no, there is not a comprehensive list of indicators available at the moment, but there are indicators out there that are surely uh, applicable to, to your situation. But I wouldn't just take them over one-on-one. -on -one. Um, someone says, I really appreciate the five steps explained by Timo to formulate national level m and strategy. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's purely focusing on national level M&E strategy, but I assume that these steps can be used for even project specific levels, uh, Timo? Uh, yes, the, the uh, document has been developed uh, for project level, um, not necessarily for a national level. Uh, because at national level you may also need to take into account the legal aspects, uh, existing institutional and government structures, micropolitics between departments and so on. All these aspects are not uh, touched upon in the publication. Mm -hmm. But in, in general terms, um, in the Philippines for example, um, where they do have these results chains already included in the Climate Change Adaptation Action Plan. Mm -hmm. In that case, it has indeed uh, been, the publication has indeed been used to guide the development of the uh, national m and &E system. So it is possible to be applied at the national level, but it has not been written with that intention uh, in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just sticking with the national level, um, 
if you would want to measure national level adaptation, would the, would the existence of uh, certain policies be an indicator? Um, it depends on what you want to measure. Um, but um, this sounds like a very general indicator. So yes, um, one indicator could be um, whether um, policies are available that promote adaptation. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, and a comment from Wahidullah, that's why he asked the question about uh, indicators. Uh, is uh, He starts a baseline study on climate change in Afghanistan, but he faces the problem in finding a guide or a sample uh, with specific indicators. Um, Wahidullah, do, do email both Tima and, Timo and myself because we, we can guide you in uh, directions of some more information uh, towards indicators. There, there is some information out there, but I wouldn't call it a comprehensive list. But email us and we'll, we'll be happy to share. Um, a question from Kong Chuan. Could you please highlight a little bit on gathering non-climate factors in step one of five in the model based on the experience from GIZ projects? That is a very good uh, aspect uh, that's been touched upon here because um, oftentimes also as, as you Dennis said we are focusing on the climate aspects but the non-climatic aspects are often uh, very important. Um, um, it's um, the answer to the question. Then is it depends on the situation. So it is, uh, in fact, it may be more difficult to to sometimes to get a, um, this uh, socio-economic information than the climate information because the climatic information, at least those on temperature and precipitation, there are global databases like the CI GRASP homepage that provide that data. Um, what GSZ is doing to get the other socio and economic um, aspects is GSZ always has um, projects in the particular countries and uh, the majority of employees of GSZ are national staff. Um, so they uh, uh, tend to be familiar with the situation and gather it on a local level. Unfortunately, there's not the one source of information that I could point you to um, to get this information. It really depends on the context and whether you're looking at local governments, for example, or certain ecosystems. Um, and, and that is what I was also mentioning in my presentation. So the, the whilst the adaptation made to measure publication does provide that framework, um, to structure the process to actually operationalize it on a local level um, it still needs then these uh, local expertise for example uh, thank you thank you I, I have another question of Yvonne T she unfortunately left but it is a good question so I'm going to ask it anyhow um, one of the challenges she foresees in integrating development and adaptation with each other is the conflicts related to financial resources to implement initiatives that overlap between development and adaptation how could funds be managed to achieve both adaptation and development goals what kind of change in mindset would be needed from the side of donors? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very good question. Um, what comes to my mind at this point is that the European Commission is uh, currently earmarking 20% of the new uh, of the funds over the next, uh, I think, five years to be explicitly uh, focused on climate change adaptation. So earmarking certain a certain proportion of the um, uh, public expenditure to be focused on climate change is uh, an interesting way to um, to to deal with that aspect. Um, the European uh, Union Union will publish a new climate change adaptation strategy, uh, focusing on mainstreaming um, climate change adaptation among all different uh, EU levels. Uh, and this public uh, strategy will be published uh, on 29th April. And um, whilst uh, there is still a difference, of course, between the EU and developing countries, this may provide some insights on how this could be um, done. Um, apart from that, international funding source, uh, more and more money is made available uh, on climate change uh, funding. The new climate change, um, the Green Climate Fund, uh, will come up in the coming years. And uh, so as more and more money is being made available with a specific focus on climate change, um, this will also help um, climate change projects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, a question from Michael Okumu. 
High-level indicators normally have several contributors. How does one single out the contribution of an adaptation project to a high-level indicator? Uh, thanks, Michael, for the, uh, for the question. Um, I guess you are pointing at the question you asked in, in previous webinars on how to link local level and national level. Um, so this is how I interpret your question. And um, yeah, so now we are at this key point. How, to what extent the national level M and E system can take take into account uh, the uh, local level adaptation actions? Because um, we, I guess most of us would agree that adaptation is taking place at the local level. Yet it is um, difficult to have a system at national system that is uh, still manageable and and yet taking into account these lessons from the local level. So this is an area where there's definitely more work needed. And uh, the only example that comes to my mind that is existing and that is somehow addressing this is in the UK, where the uh, UK Subcommittee on Adaptation is um, bringing out these um, reports every year. Uh, and they're focusing on specific topics. And for example, when they focused on flooding, they looked at what information is available on local governments. And local governments, for example, are providing the uh, permissions to build uh, buildings and infrastructure at certain places. Um, so local governments can decide whether a new infrastructure is being built at areas that are now seen as prone to flooding because of uh, climate change. Um, so in that case, this local information was used to inform an assessment that then informed uh, national level policies. And what is unique about the UK case is that they're not having a strict set of indicators from the start, but rather looking at issue-specific information that can inform an in-depth analysis, and that then is reported um, in their report. So. And I think this is an interesting model because usually everyone tries to look at, in, or oftentimes the question is, okay, what set of indicators can we have? But I would encourage uh, you to try to look at the, the other way around, look at what uh, do you want to achieve as a particular system, and what would be a best way to anal analyze it, and then what could be indicators that could help you. Thank you. Thank you for that one. Jiang Tran asks how to link m and &E at project level with m and &E at national level. Uh, one thing could be uh, to first look if the country has a national adaptation policy or a national adaptation uh, framework uh, with which they work. Uh, and if they do, they, they should normally have, a, have an indicator framework, a, a theory of change towards it as well with indicators linked to that. Um, as a as a project level, uh, as a project on on a lower level, you could link your M and E uh, towards the national level indicators that have been uh, presented by the government. Yes, I agree. For example, in the Philippine case, um, as soon as they will f finalize their set of indicators for the national level, uh, for example, on food security, and if there are uh, local level projects, then um, these projects could say they contribute to these and these indicators on the national level. However, I think there's always the need for local projects to also have their project-specific um, indicators, because most likely the national level indicators will be uh, limited in number and will be fewer in the uh, will be more more broader indicators but uh, yes that could be a good way to link them to explicitly say in your uh, national uh, in your local project development plan look at what how it is relevant to national level indicators um, that's a that's a good one, and and I know the Philippines is making quite some some headway there, and I I look forward to their uh, national plan as well. I I know they're they're working on it. Uh, Anika Olsen from uh, Diffit asks: I was wondering if you have tried to aggregate results from across the 400 adaptation programs that you mentioned. Are there any indicators that can be applied across a portfolio in a meaningful way? That is a very good question. In fact, I'm, <laughs> I like to ask the same, the very same question, whether this is possible. Um, at GIZ, we do not, um, for this very reason, I guess, we do not have indicators that would apply to all these projects. Um, so um, 
these products are mitigation and adaptation, so there would be the first difficulty to find, um, well, you would need separate indicators for mitigation and adaptation. Um, we at the moment do not have a comprehensive review of these projects. Um, that also has to do with the um, how these products come into place. Um, most of these projects are multi-year projects, and um, those projects that have started years ago uh, would have needed to include, for example, resources to contribute to such an um, uh, evaluation framework. So therefore, this could only be built in the future. But GIZ does not have uh, currently plans to, to do that because for this very um, concern that it is the question is, is it possible to do this in a meaningful way? The Adaptation Fund, for example, uh, is a prominent example where they do have indicators that apply to a whole range of different projects. And if you look at the, uh, resu um, the results-based management of uh, framework of that Adaptation Fund, you can see this list of indicators. But the broader your adaptation, uh, the broader the range of adaptation projects that you try to aggregate, um, the lower the denominator of your um, indicators. For example, an indicator then quickly becomes something like number of uh, stakeholders involved, or the UNDP once suggested an indicator, number of lessons learned, um, which is something ap applicable to many different projects. But the question is, what is a what is a lesson learned, and how does you find it? So. I, I tend to agree that it is it's difficult to define indicators that are meaningful uh, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I, I have to say that I'm looking forward to uh, USAID's work in this one because they are actually working on uh, on global climate change m and &E indicators that would then be the same for all the USAID-sponsored uh, m and &E projects because USAID has such a big portfolio, they need to um, defend um, where the money goes uh, to Congress. And uh, they can't do that on uh, non-standardized indicators, they only do that on standardized indicators. And that's the reason why they're developing um, that as well now for the climate change arena. And I, I do look forward to see what the end result will be of that exercise. Um, let me see, there is one comment from uh, Philippe McClay-Nahan who says, for your info, there is an Australian publication on the m and &E that prioritizes coastal development options for local governments and that is on www.sydneycoastalcouncils.com.au that is www.sydneycoastalcouncils.com.au uh, so that's uh, that's interesting to know um, another question from Niranjan Pujal uh, traditional knowledge is an important aspect that should be considered seriously in order to achieve any development goals how does GIZ incorporate or prioritize on traditional knowledge in its adaptation projects? Um, yes, uh, I fully agree. And that would be as part of step one when you do the situational analysis. And if the project would focus on, uh, for example, uh, a target group um, or a certain region where uh, then um, the national staff would take this into account when, uh, account when designing uh, the particular project. Uh, there are no, so to say, headquarter policies on how this should be done, um, but this will be done as part of this step one framework, uh, step one of, of the framework. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and that was for the moment the last question. I want to give you all uh, of the participants a last moment to uh, come up with a last question. If there's anyone with a final question, you have 20 seconds to uh, <laughs> type it. <laughs> and um, if not, then I would like to thank... Oh, there's a last question, and that's Useni Kinda. Uh, from an adaptation perspective, uh, baseline information needs to include climate variability and hazards. However, these hazards are often changing in light of climate conditions. As a result, traditional m and &E practices, which tend to focus on measuring progress against a set baseline, may not be sufficient to understand the complexity of the adaptation project. How, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with a moving baseline? 
Um, yes, that is a very important point, and this is indeed one of the key challenges that Adaptation Project m and is facing. We had a very good example in our last webinar last week from India, where they um, uh, the guy from India described a project they had developed and they prepared farmers for uh, drier seasons and asked them to or, or suggested to to use drought resistant crops and what happened the next season it became a very wet and rainy season um, so yes these unexpected uh, changes present a challenge to M&E and therefore it may be necessary to, to, to use shifting baselines. We also talk about this in our adaptation made to measure publication. So sometimes the initial baseline that you use may no longer uh, be relevant for your ongoing work, particularly if the project's running over uh, many years. So the M&T framework would then need to have the flexibility to allow to to, to simply use different uh, baseline uh, values uh, in in light of changed circumstances. Thank you very much for that last answer to this last question, uh, Timo. Timo, very uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your presentation as well, and, and, and thank Vera uh, from my side as well, and a thanks to all the attendees who were here today, uh, 55 strong. Uh, very good to have you here. Uh, we hope you find time when we send out tomorrow our post uh, webinar uh, survey to fill out the seven questions. Um, and I hereby would like to, to wish all of you a pleasant afternoon or a pleasant morning in uh, Europe. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you in the next webinar. Uh, Timo, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis.